Episode 206 with Representative Steve Toth. From the capital of the Lone Star State, we're engaging with Republican leaders across Texas to keep our priorities front and center, spotlight our rising stars, and making sure that the grassroots has all the tools they need to push back the Democrats and make Texas even brighter red. You are part of the Elephant Herd. Welcome back again for another episode of the Elephant Herd. We're in our third special session here in Texas, and one of the big uh, legislative priorities in this session is election integrity and specifically election audit. Well, I'm honored to be joined today by Representative Steve Toth, and he's carrying the bill in the House about election audit. Representative Toth, welcome to the show. Jonathan, good to see you. Thanks for having me today. So uh, it's taken us three special sessions, but we're here in the third one. Tell us about the the audit. And I, I know there was some election integrity that was passed in the in the second special session. So give us a little sense of what the gap was that we're trying to close uh, with your bill. So in in uh, 2016, of course, we had the Democrats saying Russia, 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 and we spent tens of millions of dollars. We destroyed three and a half years of Trump's presidency to slow him down and kept him mired, which I really think that at the end of the day, that's really all that that whole deal was about. It's just it was just keeping Donald Trump mired down so that would make it more difficult for him to advance a conservative Republican agenda. But, you know, at the end of the day, they found nothing. Well, here we are in 2020. And instead of just ridiculous innuendos and accusations by the Democrats, which is all the steel dossier was, we actually have evidence. And right here in the state of Texas, when, you know, whether whether it's SB7, HB7, or SB1, right, all the different iterations of the election integrity bill, we have heard hundreds of witnesses, hundreds of witnesses, and uh, of from people from Montgomery County, from El Paso, from Tarrant County, Dales County, all over the state of Texas, talking about election fraud that they saw with their own eyes. And here's what I, Jonathan, here's what I don't understand. If if you're willing to say it's necessary then, therefore, to pass uh, election laws, change election laws to add to the integrity of our elections, then why is it also not appropriate to do an audit and uncover what exactly, what fraud took place so that we can send people to jail? Because if there's no cost to cheating, then they'll just find a different way to cheat. If we're basically saying, you know, great, we have these great laws on the books, but, uh, you know, police officer, we're we're not actually going to investigate this. We're not actually going to go and check. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, I think think people kind of get mired in like the technical stuff. Well, you know, how is the election, uh, how is the election fraud done? They think it's computers and maybe there's a piece of that, but there's just simple like, you know, the good old fashioned dead people voting, you know, stuff in ballots. I mean, this is not really a high tech problem that's going on. It's not. And that's the, you know, that's the hard part of this thing that where I kind of feel like love Mike Lindell, love his heart, love his support for the president. But um, the, the, the election and the, the election um, problem with, with electronic voting has been a complete, and utter distraction from where the Democrats are doing it. We have so much evidence of paper fraud. It's overwhelming. And um, that's where we, you know, the, the Democrats have been really smart. It's, it's, it's uh, three yards forward in a, in, a, in, a, in a pile of dust. And they just do it really, really well. And they've done it for years. They're very successful at it. And we refuse to look into it. It makes, m- makes no sense at all to me. So when we talk about auditing an election, what exactly does your bill, what, what, is, what does that mean? How many counties, how frequent, what, you know, if we're talking about, okay, we're actually going to hold people accountable. We're actually going to, you know, inspect what we expect. You know, that's what I learned in the Air Force. Uh, what is it that we're going to be inspecting? Break, break us into the details of that. I'd like to take basically the 12 largest counties in the state of Texas. And rather than doing a risk limiting audit, which is useless, risk risk limiting audits, the only thing they do is they check boxes. 
was this system followed? Was that system followed? Did this person sign uh, off on it? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, nothing to see here. Well, th that doesn't answer the question whether or not the, the voter voting rolls are legitimate. It doesn't a answer the question whether or not um, ballots were falsified. It doesn't answer the question whether ballot harvesting occurred. It doesn't answer the question whether or not the Democrat Party in one of these counties voted for people. It doesn't answer the question, which this was the really cool thing that they did in Maricopa County. They got really creative and they said, uh, let's call people that didn't vote. And so they went into these red precincts, thousands of red, um, among thousands of red voters that d supposedly didn't vote. And when they called them, they found out, yeah, I voted. Hell yes, I voted. Um, but there's no record of them voting, which means there is no vote. You know, I think Maricopa is obviously, you know, a, a case study. And what's been reported, you know, the highlight is, well, the counts came back the same or there wasn't a whole lot of difference. And it's like no one's arguing that you can't count paper. That's 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 not the argument. The argument is, are, are those votes valid? Did, did did people do it? That was the problem is that the press, they love to say, well, Maricopa County came back and said the vote was was fine. But what they failed to report was that the purpose of the audit was to uncover fraud, and they uncovered more fraud than they ever anticipated. And that's the really frustrating thing in this thing is that, so because Maricopa County came back and the numbers were the same, which is what we said would happen, which is what we said would happen. Um, but we're afraid, and that's the problem with the Republican Party is that we're afraid of our own shadow across the United States. We don't want to be called woke. We don't want to be called conspirators. We, 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 don't, we don't want to get the mainstream media mad at us. Oh, that'd be awful. Screw it. They're, they're going to be mad at us, you know, and, and you know, I, I think this whole, you know, talk about the risk limiting. I mean, that that's fine in business when there, there's a case that can be made that, that everyone is, is intentionally doing the, you know, trying to do the right thing. But we know that there are bad actors. I don't, I don't care if, you know, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, like there's bad actors and everyone should assume that there's bad actors in an election. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's not conspiratorial. <laughs> that's, that's reasonable. And, and so, you know, we, we can't kind of have this, oh, yeah, we're going to have this accounting thing and we'll make sure the process was, flat, you know, was, was followed. We need to investigate everything. So um, what, what is the, what, what's the bill uh, what's the what's the bill number in the session? So SB is it SB twenty six, Braden? Is it, SB twenty six? I believe is the one that's coming over from the Senate, and um, that's what we want to focus on right now. Dan Patrick, like of uh, Patrick, has done a great job moving that through the Senate. Um, the author of that is Paul Betancourt. It's on. It's I, I believe it. It's it, I think it comes over to the House um, this next week, and and uh, it's going to be. Ref we just need the speaker to refer it to a committee. And um, one of the joint authors on that bill will be, you know, Chairman Kane of the Elections Committee. We need it to go to his committee so we can get it voted out and get it on the floor. Let's quit screwing around, get this done. We know it took place. We know it happened. Everyone knows it happened. The, the support for an audit across the state of Texas among Republicans is off the charts. Um, let's get this going. I, I think it actually must be done. Let me let me change topics a little bit because another thing that's going on here in Texas, um, and and with COVID and the Biden administration is these um, really kind of breakthrough treatments. Uh, I I don't know if I'll pronounce it right, but I think it's mon monoclonal. Is that how it's pronounced? But but what's going monoclonal. on? Monoclonal. Monoclonal. I feel yeah. like I'm in a Star Wars movie. Um, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what's going on and some of the challenges that we're, uh, you know, dealing with here in Texas. Well, of course, the the um, the Democrats want to keep everything about the jab, get the jab, get the jab. And if there's anything that would preclude you from getting the jab, like a treatment that actually works, that actually saves your life, they don't want to talk about it. So here you've got Harris County, the fourth largest county in the United States that had the opportunity to get this infusion center. And they said, mm, no, thanks. We don't want it. Let me, let me just make sure when you say they said this was Harris County, this, the, the, you know, who's the, they let, who's the, they that said, no, we don't want it. Um, Haralina Heldago. Oh, and, and she's a, she's a Democrat, uh, judge. Is I, am I right on that? Yeah, she is a Democrat judge. And for, for all of her people there in Harris County. And, and, you know, here's the thing is that, 
um, Hispanics, African Americans, they have a higher mortality rate when it comes to COVID. She had the opportunity to step up and do the right thing and help these folks. And she did nothing. They didn't want the, the infusion center. So we got it here in Montgomery County. And um, it, Jonathan, it's been amazing. We've had like 1,900 people, 2,000 people that have gone through. Not one has been hospitalized. I, I interviewed a guy this morning that you know was on his deathbed. They let him out of the hospital because they got his, his oxygen concentration up above 93%. He came directly over here, got the infusion, and within 72 hours was feeling like a new man. You know, I'm so sick and tired of these doctors that say, oh, you've got COVID. There's nothing we can do. Wring our hands. We're, you're, you're in rough shape. Go home, take Tylenol, drink plenty of water. And when you're ready to die, then call us and we'll put you on a ventilator, uh, you know, as you die. I mean, it's just it's so it's so freaking ridiculous. And we had this thing that was working really, really well. And then the Biden administration stepped in and said to Florida and to Texas, you can't have it. We're taking it away from you. And so they started sending monoclonal antibodies to all these blue states that weren't using it. And it's still not being used. And these blue states, these blue states have an unbelievable am, uh, inventory of monoclonal antibodies that will go bad and no one will use them. So the state of Texas stepped up. I'm on the appropriations committee and we're going to appropriate several million dollars to it uh, because this works and it will keep people out of the hospital, which will in turn save the state of Texas billions and billions of dollars. You know, this this whole the politicization of this disease is just it it's it's mind numbing and, and if you know, if eighteen months into eighteen days to stop the spread has not awakened you that this is not about medical practice. This is about fear and control. This has not been about the science and the data since March of last year. That's when it ceased to be about the science and the data. It's just been about fear, hysteria and anecdotal stories. True. True. Well, I want to take a quick break, but I want to come back. I want to kind of talk about sort of your philosophy of governance. So we'll be right back. You're listening to The Elephant Herd. We'll be right back. Promises. God's promises. He makes them and he keeps them. Hi, I'm Pastor Vic Schober, and I have a good promise for you to know about. It's the uh, Book of Matthew, the gospel that talks about Jesus, and it's his Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7 and verse 32, wherein we read, whoever hears what I say and does it is like a wise man that built his house on a rock. You don't want to go build a house on sand. It won't stand the storms and the wind and the rain. No, you want to be on a solid rock. And he's telling you that if you will build your life on the solid rock, who of course is Jesus Christ, then uh, uh, you will be a wise man and your wisdom will be seen by many and you can share it wherever you go because your foundation is on solid rock, bedrock solid on Jesus Christ. I'm Vic Schober. And I'm here to tell you God keeps his promises. From the capital of the Lone Star State, welcome back to the Elephant Herd. We're here today with Representative Steve Toth, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of your your governing philosophy. You know, I don't know if a lot of people recognize this, but, you know, most state representatives uh, here in Texas, it's it's a part-time job. You're typically in session 140 days right. uh, every other year. Now, now, this has been a little bit of a unique uh, year this with is, yeah the session that won't end yeah this is the this is the one <laughs> session that won't end but one of the things when when I when I ask people to come on the show one of the questions I always ask them is what are you passionate about and 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 I loved what you said and here's what I want to spend a few minutes talking about you said li- what you're most passionate about is liberty as given to us by God and emphasized in the U.S. Constitution kind of unpack that for us a little bit. Leftists don't believe in God. They <laughs> well, they believe, believe in, in God. they believe in a God. Uh, they they just don't believe in the same one. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think most that I talk to believe that God is a fable, and because they don't believe in a God, they don't believe in natural rights. You know, at least the founding fathers, if they couldn't believe in Jesus Christ or they didn't believe in the Hebrew God, they believed in nature's God at the very least, and they believed that. Our rights come from God or nature's God. Therefore, government 
doesn't give you the right. And that's what that is what makes America exceptional. You know, it, it was it was only a few years after the American Revolution that you had the French Revolution. Here, 200 plus years later, we're still going strong, although we're in, in rough shape right now. But the French Revolution within 12 years gave way to Napoleon Bonaparte. Why? Because their rights didn't come from God. They're, well, they do. They still come from God. But they believe that rights came from from the government. And that led to tyranny and, and anarchy. And it led to Napoleon Bonaparte stepping in to bring law and order to the to the French Revolution. But that is what makes America exceptional, that our rights come from God and that the only thing that government exists for is to secure these rights. And that is all government should do, nothing more than that. And unfortunately, we've become very wayward. We've asked government to do too much. So as you kind of sit here and you can really answer this, you know, as a, as a legislator, husband, father, but, but what, what is it that keeps you up at night? This, I can remember, and this is, I, I, this is going to sound kind of weird, but it was 30 years ago, I built an addition on the back of my house and I was watching a news account in Paris as socialists were ransacking and burning Paris. And I thought to myself, what a blessing that I get to live in the United States where this will never happen to us. And it's happening to us, Jonathan. It's, it's, it's overwhelming to see that the vast majority of kids coming from the public schools today are adopting socialist beliefs and that they think that they can in some way, shape or form do it um, better than Pol Pot or, um, you know, better than Mao Zedong. Um, it's, it's not, this is gonna be the same damn conclusion as we've seen every other place. And I pray that God would give us one more chance as parents, as lawmakers, moms and dads, to instruct our children, teach our children, teach your children well, teach your children well, instead of believing that the public schools are going to do it for us because they're not. Unfortunately, too many in the public schools have been the enemy of liberty. They've been the enemy of, of, of faith. They've been the enemy of the family today, as they're trying to say through Merrick Garland, you know, we will raise your kids. Moms and dads, you're not responsible for raising your kids. We are. And if you show up at a school board meeting, and you talk smack, we'll throw your ass in jail. Enough of that. Screw that. We're going to start fighting back. That's what keeps me up at night. Absolutely. You know, we just did an episode right here in Round Rock ISD. We had two parents thrown in jail uh, by what I believe is just clearly an abuse of power uh, by a school board. So I think that's a that's a sobering thought, but I think it's it's very true. And I think the the takeaway action is, you know, if, if – if you're listening to this podcast, you're clearly involved and engaged. I think the action item is make sure that your friends, your families, your church members, your other people are awake and engaged and doing something. Because the, the, the only chance that we have is when good men step in and engage. Because if we allow this to continue, it goes to a very bad place that, that it's just a repeat of history. And it was a great experiment while it lasted. So I think that's a great advice. Well, if someone wants to reach you or contact you on your, on your uh, campaign or what you're doing in Montgomery County, what's the uh, website? Steve, well, you can email me at steve at stevetothfortexas.com. Um, that's steve at stevetothfortexas.com, all spelled out. Or you can call me on my cell, 281-770-7287. That's 281-770-7287. And yes, I'll actually uh, pick it up. It's here. It is right here. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, we're going we're to have people call you. Well, Steve, re- Representative right. Toth, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the Thanks, show. Jonathan. God bless you, buddy. Same. Appreciate what you're doing. All right, my pleasure. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, uh, you can send a comment or questions or suggestions about for future episodes. You can text me at 512-729-5712. If you want to listen to previous episodes, you can hear all recorded episodes at texasgop.org slash podcast. The Elephant Herd is provided by Texas Political Training and Empowerment and the Republican Party of Texas and is not authorized by any candidate or candidates committee. If you found this episode valuable, please subscribe to The Elephant Herd, leave an honest rating, 
You can get all the links to your favorite podcast listening apps at texasgop.org slash podcast.